So now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to hand things off to Matt. Over to you, Matt. Welcome to the What the Future podcast webinar. In today's episode, we're talking about the future of money. We'll talk cryptocurrency and its UX issues. We'll talk about who controls the money of the future. We'll talk about the myth of the sharing economy. We'll talk about the so-called unbanked population. We'll layer in a ton of data and insights from experts within Ipsos and beyond. You'll walk away with a lot of big questions you and your organization should be thinking about, and of course, researching. And you'll have some data and ideas about how to go about shaping those conversations in your company. This is a story about financial services, but it's also a story about the biggest concert event of the summer. I'm Matt Carmichael, the editor of What the Future, and I'll be your host today. Ready? <laughs> I used to be a concert photographer. If you knew me then, I was the coolest guy you knew. Although I'm sure I'm much cooler now as a market researcher, right? Anyway, I spent my evenings and weekends doing something that I took for totally for granted, going out in a crowd. You probably did too. We all went out. We spent time with people. We were mashed in. Sometimes we were the crowd surfer. Sometimes we were the guy below him, red-faced and just hoping we wouldn't get kicked in the head. Regardless, we were experiencing things, real things, in person. And when we did that, when we went out, we spent real money on real things. We bought tickets, passes, wristbands, t-shirts. We spent nine bucks on a bottle of water and 15 bucks on a beer. This year, one of the biggest concert events of the year wasn't Lollapalooza or Coachella. Nope, because it's the pandemic. The big concert took place on TikTok, and it starred the weekend. You probably didn't attend, but your kids might have. Pro tip, do yourself a favor and check out his track, Blinding Lights, which probably would have been the song of the summer in a normal summer. This concert had everything. It had real-time polling. It raised a ton of money for social justice. More than 2 million attended, which would fill Chicago's Soldier Field 30 times over. Its user-generated content generated billions, with a B, of views. It even had merch. Wait, even? I mean, of course it had merch. But it was all virtual. The weekend performed as an avatar. And there's a plausible scenario whereby newly required virtual experiences, like virtual and augmented realities, are accelerated as an alternative to in-person gatherings. Coupled with a world in which real experiences become much more of a luxury. As we pause it into the intro to this issue, tickets to a Rolling Stones concert already cost hundreds or thousands of dollars when they're selling 60,000 tightly packed seats a night. Imagine if they can only sell 2,500 in that same stadium for small, distanced, enclosed pods. Or as an alternative, people could watch in the comfort of their living rooms for 50 bucks. It won't be the same as being there, but for most, it'll be all they can afford. They'll be able to upgrade that experience and pay for more camera angles or to project their face onto one of the backup singers. Maybe they're paying for that with a credit card, or maybe they're earning virtual currencies by watching Mick and Keith videos and sharing the band's posts on social media or visiting sponsor and partner websites. All this is to say, that virtual currencies already exist in some ways. If currency is give or take 5,000 years old, we're still very much in the early stages of what will eventually be a massive shift. 
like we're seeing in so many sectors, from physical things to digital things. But even more than other sectors, this shift could be the most pronounced and profound. Let's dig in. Here's some topics we're going to cover during our time together today. Does the economy matter? Are we really ready for a cashless future? Your data is currency. How could or would insurance companies use it? Who controls the currency of the future? How do we get the unbanked banked? And is that even the right question? Did we or can we ever have a truly sharing economy? And for those of you new to With the Future, it's a now monthly publication from Ipsos about the future of a given theme. This webinar isn't your usual Ipsos webinar. Think of this more as a podcast. So here's how we're gonna tackle the topics. We'll ask big questions. We'll present fresh, exclusive Ipsos data from today that will shape the trends of tomorrow. We'll hear from experts, both within Ipsos and beyond. We'll hear from, for lack of a better term, real people, thanks to our ethnography project, America in Flux. And now, onto the data. Chapter one, does the economy matter? As James Carville taught us, of course it does. Often, it's the only thing that does matter. Therefore, it's hard to talk about money and not also talk about the economy. And while we're not gonna go too deeply down into it, because we know a lot of the story, right? It's important to set a couple of useful benchmarks to help shape the story. First off, many, many Americans don't have a lot of money. During the pandemic, that's gotten worse. High unemployment and frankly, high uncertainty have people feeling anxious. Many are having a hard time paying their bills, harder than usual. When coupled with almost two thirds feeling that borrowing money from a bank is stressful, you can see where some problems will crop up. We asked about trust, which we'll have a big report on next month. Who do you trust to protect your money? We asked this in February and again in August, and we see some movement in the trust for digital payment companies. Banks still far outpace, but none of these is really high, which to me smells ripe for disruption. To make the obvious analogy, had we asked years ago, would you hop into a car with a stranger? People would have said no, and then Uber. So if we asked, would you use a cleverly named app on your phone to wire money to people's mobile numbers or email addresses from your actual checking account? Folks might have shaken their head. Yet here we are. People are using mobile wallets and COVID is changing the game. I don't know about you, but I went to an ATM for the first time in a half a year the other day. Now I'm on Zelle, PayPal, and Venmo. Though that's partially just for Girl Scout money. In other words, I joined these services because of a generational gap. I'm a Gen Xer in an office with many younger folks. And when I help my daughter sell cookies at the office, no one wants to pay me with cash. They all use digital services and not all the same ones. So now I have accounts on many. One reason COVID is accelerating this is because we're doing things for other people. Jaron in Washington state is a participant in an ethnography study we've been conducting called America in Flux. He's running errands for other people who are afraid to go out and be exposed. This is happening in neighborhoods, in families and beyond. And people need an easy way to pay each other. My family's Venmo account almost looked like we were money laundering with so many transactions back and forth between us and our neighbors. In the before times, when we actually started work on this issue, all the talk was around cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. There's still some interest here, of course, but what will it take to get this to really start to gain ground and really become mainstream? All of this leads us to our first big question. Everything we've talked about to this point is about digital in some way or another. So are we ready for a cashless future? Or will that question look something like the early arguments of the internet that it would kill off all paper-based things? Let's dig in. Now, of course, we are already largely cashless, right? Credit cards, virtual payments, tap to pay, touchless payments. 
Heck, even checks are all forms of pain without actual cash. Jonathan Johnson is the CEO of Overstock.com, and he has been accepting cryptocurrency as a form of payment since January 2014. Overstock is bullish on the blockchain technology that underlies cryptocurrency and really believes in cryptocurrency as a way to help democratize capital in the future. In particular, to bank the unbanked or underbanked in our society. But as Johnson says, the money I carry around in my pocket is almost like carrying around my handkerchief. Seldom used, but there for an emergency. His company, Overstock.com, is an early adopter of crypto. So say you find yourself in the market for a desk or five, like because your home is now two offices and three classrooms as mine is. First off, they have them in stock, which is a massive win these days. But second, when you go to check out, you can pay with Bitcoin. That's something you still don't see very often. But as our experts say, one of the critical components of moving crypto to the mainstream will be simply having places to spend it other than on Russian hacker schemes. Because having your product largely associated with piracy isn't necessarily the best model. But I want to go back to trust for a moment. We talked a bit earlier about who people trust to protect their money. When it comes to growing it, we see that the most trusted is none of the above. You recall that banks are trusted by the majority to protect. But when we drill into that a bit, we see younger consumers, as with most things, are the most trusting of digital. Again, this sounds like prime time for disruption, either through new players or through existing players changing some of the rules. That's especially true in a time of upheaval. Yes, people want comfort foods and comfort shows on TVs, but where their routines are forced out, they're trying new stuff. So yeah, Johnson is bullish on crypto, but he recognizes that volatility in its value is something that holds people back, at least in the US. So he sees one factor that will make adoption grow, is stability. Here's what he had to say. Cryptocurrency is, is certainly volatile compared to the U.S. dollar, but you know, compared to the Argentinian currency, it's not volatile. It's a great store of value, uh, and so different people will see it as a solution to their problem, while other people will say, "Oh, this is today. This is a fad, or you know, the, the beginning of a new frontier." I do think over time, there's more retailers accept cryptocurrency that it will become less volatile. Rumi Morales is a longtime investor and entrepreneur in advanced technologies. She's a partner in a firm called Outlier Ventures, focused on virtual and digital technologies and digital currency, as well as other advanced technologies like quantum computing, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things. Kate MacArthur talked to her about quantum computing the idea that processors will get super duper ultra fast and make today's computers seems as powerful as Casio watches were. But one of the knocks on crypto is that it's a massive drain on resources. The amount of computing power and therefore on actual electrical power needed to power the blockchain and keep those cool computers cool is enormous. But what if computers got better? Would it be easier to take part in blockchain transactions? Or would it be easier to crack the crypto itself? The answer, as with so many things related to crypto and blockchain, is that it's a little early to tell. What we do know is that people are slow to adopt for a variety of reasons we'll get into in a moment. Only a handful of people plan to purchase cryptocurrency this year on one of our surveys. And while younger folks are more interested, those numbers are still pretty low. Jonathan Johnson talked about how retail adoptions, i.e. having a place to spend it, would help. That's one thing. Rumi talks about a couple of other factors. One is that people might not be what drives adoption. It might be machines. Your car might come embedded with X coins, she says, and just pay for what it needs in terms of fuel or tolls. But who controls that transaction? She points out, and this is one of my favorite quotes from the whole issue, there is no Federal Reserve of things. Here's her other big point, in her words. 
I think the important thing to note is that there are a number of cryptocurrencies. There are over 2,000, 3,000 right now cryptocurrencies. Right now, it's it's going to be, it can be hard to determine um, what it's going to look like for the average person once it's at scale, because we don't know which, which cryptocurrency at the end of the day will take off. Bitcoin is perhaps the most well-known of the current cryptocurrencies, but it does have limitations and flaws, um, not being aligned with any uh, sovereign nation or central bank currently can be seen as a potential flaw. Um, China is developing its own cryptocurrency, its digital currency at the moment. And if that takes off, um, then it could have very wide reaching ramifications for people at scale. If, for example, payment apps such as um, Alipay and Tencent, but also perhaps Apple Pay end up using uh, Chinese digital currency, then it can have a very direct impact on people, uh, whether they realize that or not. So we said that one of the big knocks on blockchain and cryptocurrencies was the drain on resources required to mine it. We asked about some of the reasons people weren't adopting. One massive one was a simple lack of interest. But as it takes off or further disruptions occur, that can start to take care of itself. With most breakthrough changes, people aren't interested until they are. Value instability is an issue. The security of the product itself You've heard the stories of, oh, my hard drive crashed and now I've lost everything. One report even said that criminals were moving away from Bitcoin because of the volatility. They had to keep adjusting their own ransom demands. Another story, which I can't seem to confirm but will count as plausible if not actually true, is that Russian pirates had to set up customer service hotlines to walk people through how to pay their ransom demands. Because here's the other problem although this one could be solved perhaps with better research. The user experience sucks. One tech reporter, and I know this guy, he's no slouch, tried to join an initial coin offering for a journalism startup called Civil. Here are some of the 44 steps it took. That's a lot. Not many of us have that kind of patience and savvy. So UX testing and UX theory being applied could help the adoption too. I talked to Jana Baranek, an SVP in our UX practice, about this, because that's a fun thing about working at Ipsos. When I'm curious about something, I can just go find someone who's an expert in that thing and ask them. So I wondered, what would it take UX-wise to make this better? She told me that there are five factors they look at at UX testing. Product fit, look and feel, inspiration, operability, and learnability. And let's face it, crypto is kind of failing on all of these. This is an issue about money, which is a way of saying things that are a placeholder for value. And one form of currency, though it's often used as barter, is data, specifically your data. Part of the idea and hype of crypto is that it's decentralized and doesn't have the same privacy concerns that, say, current credit card and digital transactions have. When you buy something with your credit card, a lot of systems touch that data, and all of them are potentially sharing it and selling it. There's another side to that coin, however, and that comes from a different part of the financial services ecosystem. Insurance. For that, Kate talked to Dorothy Andrews. If there could possibly be such a thing, she is a rock star actuary. She's the chief behavioral data scientist for the Actuarial Analytics Consortium. You've heard the saying that if you're not a paying customer, you're a product. In some cases, you're both. You get a health wearable and share that data with your health insurer. Or you put a device on your car that promised you a discount for driving well. You're entering into a barter relationship for something that is quite valuable, your data. It's valuable to target you with ads. It's valuable to gauge the risk of you defaulting on a loan. And it's valuable to insurers to determine your true risk based on your personal behavior rather than just a huge pool of people with similar demographics. The trick is that then insurers can cherry pick who they insure. It's like gerrymandering. Instead of voters picking the candidate, 
the candidate picks the voters. You're already seeing this with companies like Root Insurance, who proudly proclaims they only insure safe drivers. And sure, there can be a payoff for those who are low risk and therefore don't get lumped in with everyone else. As Dorothy says, there's going to have to be some kind of societal mechanism to make that whole equation work. More people agree than disagree that wearing a health tracker should lead to a discount on premiums. Many think that sharing data could lead to fairer prices, although fairer for whom is an interesting question. But in an odd bit of self-awareness, Americans, roughly 75% of whom are overweight, very few think their own life insurance premiums would go down if they shared information about their health. Dorothy takes a rather utopian view on this, wherein the industry solves the ethical and privacy concerns and can just use the data to promote better outcomes for people. Here's what she had to say. If my vision becomes reality, there's going to be nothing that people can hide from anyone. There are not going to be any secrets. That's how pervasive technology is in, in, in my vision of the future. Everyone's going to know everything about everyone because that's how we're going to drive efficiency. So um, I, I just think, you know, we're not going to, we're going to be living in a world with no secrets um, at some point. I don't know how soon, but it, in order for all this cool technology to really work and to continue to evolve, we just can't have secrets. And, and what I like to say is we have to make our data in the wrong hands useless because we spend a lot of time, you know, with cybersecurity trying to protect data. A lot of this technology, it thrives off of data. Data is its lifeblood. And if it's not available, um, I think we're just all going to suffer. We're just not going to be able to have certain kinds of technology. Critics might say, this is yet another way will exacerbate financial disparity on one hand. On the other hand, it might be a way to make insurers more financially healthy. As with all things, the people with the most risk pay the most to access the system. Credit cards, loans, insurance. It's just that the people most likely impacted are the ones who can least afford it. Or the rest of us who pick up the tab from a car accident with the uninsured or the hospital bills when some people default on them. It wouldn't be a What the Future webinar if we didn't bring in Douglas Adams. Douglas Adams, the late author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, was a visionary futurist in many ways. But this quote was short-sighted, it turned out. Now, we don't even move green pieces of paper to try and make us happy. As you've heard, all the solutions we've been talking about are digital which could also create an even worse economic divide. Mass crypto might be down the line a bit. So maybe you're using digital payments today and in the future. And again, one thing our interviewees said over and over was things like, let's see how this all this plays out. This could happen in a number of ways. This stuff's all super new in the scheme of things. So this gets us back to the question, of people being banked and people trusting banks, but also trusting no one, which leaves room for other players to disrupt. But of course, the current players have a lot of power and are looking to experiment, not just with payments, but with their own currencies. Which leads us to our penultimate question. Will all of this technology help close economic divides or will it make them wider? To get at that, we talked to an Ivy League professor, Lisa Servan, who spent some time doing research on the population that doesn't have regular access to bank accounts. She dislikes, although uses the term unbanked, because she says that presumes there's a problem and that the solution is clearly to make them banked. So she worked for a time at a check cashing store and talked to its customers. Her concern is mostly one of access. How do we get people especially historically underserved people, the ability to take part in the financial system in a meaningful way, to borrow successfully, to save, to build wealth. And to be clear, when we say underserved, we're talking about young Americans, under unemployed, people with a criminal background, women, black and Hispanic Americans. Or are we? Increasingly, 
when we talk about the economic issues, we're also talking about the traditional middle class. That's who a lot of her customers turned out to be. Here's Lisa. The other thing that really has an effect on people's behavior is going back to that kind of the employment stability stuff that I talked about with the changing nature of the middle class. So I haven't done a lot of interviews with Gen Z, but I've done a lot with millennials who just feel like, you know, they have a lot of debt. Um, They are, they, they don't feel as though if they do X, Y, and Z, they'll get A, B, and C, right? So like I grew up in a world in which, you know, if you work hard and you go to college, you can get a job that will allow you to have have children and, you know, be able to afford them, buy a house and save for retirement. And now I see um, people kind of trading those things off almost or thinking like, well, I can do one of those things, but not the other. Maybe I can only have one child or I can get a, either get a job that I love or I can, get one that'll, that I won't really love, but it'll give me enough money to do these things. They've seen firsthand their parents be upside down on their mortgage and have to go back to work or work much longer than they thought they would. So that's the kind of uh, role modeling that they're seeing. Noelle, a 30-something in rural Georgia and part of our syndicated America in Flux ethnography, found herself working from home instead of commuting 75 miles to her job. She decided to take better control of her finances with some of her newfound extra time. But extra time didn't mean she had extra money. Here she is in her own words. So I started using this app called Albert, which I haven't learned thoroughly how to use yet. But from what I understand, it's how you track all of your bills. Um, I've also learned from one of my friends to write down... um, how much I'm going, how much my paycheck is, and then a breakdown of each of my bills so I know up front how much I have left over and then portion everything accordingly. My friend makes a lot less money than I do, and he's a single father, so if he can make it work on what he makes, then surely he knows how to balance his money and can help me. <laughs> we talked with Jason Brown, a chief client officer with Ipsos who's worked for many years helping financial services companies. He talked about how Brazil increased financial inclusion by putting more branches in underserved communities versus Kenya, which took a highly technology-driven approach, facilitating peer-to-peer transactions via mobile devices. Financial inclusion there nearly doubled between 2011 and 2017, according to the World Bank, and more so in Kenya with a technology approach. He says the old goal of 100% inclusion in traditional banking might be the wrong marker with the acceleration of digital services, but that financial technology companies can likely bridge that to move us toward 100% inclusion in platforms that allow for all populations to save and grow wealth. Even as cash loses some of its appeal to digital and cryptocurrencies, as we see in this global advisor study from earlier this year, it's certainly not going away anytime soon. So banks will, of course, have a huge role to play in this discussion for years to come. And in fact, customers think banks have a fair amount of responsibility in this space to educate, to support both people and small businesses that make up their customer bases, to teach people how to save, invest, grow, and manage their money. One of those aspects, of course, is lending. And people are really divided on that process. Many find it convenient, but we're split on whether it's too easy or too hard. Part of that depends, of course, on demographics. And part of it gets back to these underserved populations again. Part of it, also, is behavioral science. Now, those of a certain age will remember Gilligan's Island episode, where a producer was shipwrecked on the island and then whipped up a musical version of Hamlet. That, oddly, has been stuck in my head for nearly four decades. And if you'll forgive me, and admittedly, you might not, I'm going to make a little money right now because a coworker bet me that I wouldn't have the nerve to actually sing this part of the musical. Neither a borrower nor a lender be. Do not forget. Stay out of debt. So to better understand our relationship with spending and debt, We spoke with Jesse Itzkowitz in the Ipsos Behavioral Science Center. He talked about how if borrowing becomes too easy, 
and we see that in apps promising a mortgage in seconds, or paying becomes too frictionless. There are downsides. Payment pain is how much friction these payment types produce. This is due not only to the forms of payment, where people may have to physically count the money or calculate the number to put on a check versus just swiping a card or tapping a phone, but also to the delay in receiving the goods and actually paying for them. One study found that when shoppers perceive a service takes longer due to the effort involved, they rate that service 47% higher as more valuable to their lives. Therefore, lenders offering frictionless application and availability may suffer from the perception that they are not high quality lenders or that the terms and conditions of their offers might be substandard to competitors who have more steps to the lending or who just take longer to approve applications. Crazy, huh? Okay, time for our one big final question. Can the sharing economy change how we view money? The sadly recently late anthropologist David Graeber points out in his book about a 5,000 year history of debt, which is actually more of a page turner than one might imagine. He says that one of the central fallacies of economics is the idea that currency was born out of a means of moving transactions from a pure barter state. However, he argues there is zero historical record of any economy on earth which ever functioned as a pure, I have a goat and you have some wheat kind of economy. Debt, instead, is what he said led to currency. So I spoke with Douglas Rushkoff, the author of Team Human, and really one of the more interesting cats out there. He talked about what a sharing economy is and what it isn't. In the earliest days of the web, he said, the internet was really good at facilitating genuine barter. Do you remember that site that would connect people who wanted to travel on the cheap with people who had a spare couch and a desire for the company of strangers? Sure, that all worked. And if we're being honest with ourselves, much of what is called the sharing or gig economy today is also a myth. Uber is basically a taxi service with a better app and better marketing. Airbnb as it functions is basically a hotel service, although more like a small business version. But it's a perpetuating myth. New ecosystems will involve, obviously delivery, but maybe even education. We'll see what the fall brings. But all of these services exist, and the gig economy versions of those have accelerated or cratered since COVID because of the economics that have been a running theme. People are cobbling together a living wage, or at least a wage, not with a single job as in the past, but with multiple sources of income. The proverbial side hustles presumed you had a main hustle. Now many just have a series of side hustles, more like a salad bar. Rushkoff points out that what's really being shared in the current idea of the sharing economy is people themselves. You get three hours of this guy and then two hours of that woman while someone else picks up an hour of the first guy, he said. So what we really need, what would really be a move to a different form of economy brings us back to the historical idea of the commons. Here's what he had to say. I mean, the other thing that could make some of this happen is just the collapse. You know, the inability to keep it going in this other way. You know, it was just, we'll force people. If you don't have work, if you don't have enough money, start to find other ways. This is what I was trying to argue back in the crash of 2007 and eight, you know, that, that if you're in a city, if you've got, you know, people with skills, and people with needs, you have everything you need for an economy. You know, but if you've got, you know, someone with a broken refrigerator, someone with a fixed refrigerator, if you've got someone who knows how to do math and someone's kid who doesn't, if you, you know, you all of a sudden, I mean, again, it sounds like barter, but a, an economy shouldn't be strangled for lack of a means of exchange between all these people that have value. You know, and that's where some of the sharing economy apps have uh, kind of created the, 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 they've kind of opened people's eyes to the idea that, oh, we could transact directly with each other. All of this discussion of money, currency, lending, digital payment, and basic access to financial systems presumes one thing, that enough people have enough money to spend to keep the system going. At the moment, that's a struggle for a lot of us here in the U.S. 
These challenges people are facing and the ongoing issues of equality and access are recurring themes as we think about what the future. Sarah in Wisconsin, whom we're about to hear from, was having a hard time making ends meet in the early part of the pandemic. She's since found a factory job to help pay the bills, but it's still tough. I want to end with her from our syndicated America Influx ethnography as a reminder to all of us that as we think about the future, we need to remember that solving all of our technological problems is only part of the equation. We need to solve for the humans above all. It's like I used to be able to just, you know, go to like Walgreens or Walmart or whatever and just buy things I need. And like now I'm not even able to do that. You know, like I can't even go get like shampoo and conditioner at my own will because I don't have the money, you know. I've actually had some shampoo and conditioner just like stocked up that given to me that I just never used because I guess it wasn't really like my, it's not my preferred brand, you know what I mean? So like I never used it, but now I'm like actually like pulling that stuff out and using it because I'm just so desperate. Like I have to use it. This has been the What the Future Money webinar podcast. I'd like to thank you all for coming out. Join us again next month as we talk about the future of truth and unveil our companion report on misplaced trust. See this report and all our back issues about gender, food, beauty, travel, transportation, healthcare, and even the future of vice at future.ipsos.com. Again, this is Matt Carmichael for Ipsos. Thank you all for coming out. We'll see you again next month. Thank <laughs> you.